So as we move into our next segment, I just want to ask the question, have you ever met with a client and wondered, what are they thinking? <laughs> or you lean over in a meeting and you're kind of like, what did they say? Well then, do you guess? Did you guess wrong? Well, now is your chance to take a peek behind the curtain and explore the design process from the client's perspective. Uh, Matt Dawson of Forick is our mixologist for this panel. Um, he graciously uh, jumped in when uh, Gord Dorrit, who uh, uh, was supposed to be here, had a family emergency. So thank you, Matt. Um, He's got a panel of innovative developers, um, and they've promised, promised to demystify what they really want and what they don't want when it comes to mixed-use design. Let's give them a hand. Thank you, and thank you, everybody. And welcome to Client Confidential, what developers really want from their design partner. I'm, I'm, I'm like many of you. I'm a designer working in the, uh, in the theme design and themed entertainment business. And so I'm here to ask these gentlemen some, some questions about how they see the world from their side. We want to lift the curtain on the owner's viewpoint and see what resonates with them about designers and design teams and what doesn't. So I'm going to be asking the questions, and I'd, I'd ask that you think about your questions to pose to the gentleman as well as we get to the, uh, to the, uh, the tail end of our, uh, of our <coughs> session. I'd like to introduce the panelists first. I have with me Jim Bagley, from, uh, CEO from City Communities. Jim's an industry leader in destination resort development. City Communities is one of the largest producers of vacation rental property in the U.S. Vertically integrated in uh, city communities are, include land development, home building, hotel, retail, water park construction, and even vacation rental management. Uh, Jim's projects are, are located here in Orlando, including the Margaritaville development, as well as in Myrtle Beach, Pigeon Forge, Gatlinburg, Hilton Head, and, and elsewhere. Joining me along with Jim is uh, John Ott, Vice President uh, Development of Bayshore Capital. So John has broad knowledge of the development business, managing at-risk construction and real estate development projects, and currently has responsibility for Bayshore Capital's projects in Florida. Most recently, John has uh, led the Lake Nona Hotel Project for Tavistock Development Company. And previously, interesting, previously in, in his career, John also had the role of Director of Hotel Development for Walt Disney Imagineering and VP of Development for Hard Rock International. So thank you again for, for coming to this session. I'm going to open the, the, uh, the session up for basically three chapters. And the first chapter I want to talk about is, um, and ask questions about is, is what, what happens before we as designers see a project? You know, as designers, we tend to think of the project as when we, we come on board. And of course, from the owner's perspective, the project starts long before that as they're starting to frame up the deal and do a lot of the foundational work, which is so critical to the success of the project. So the first few questions are going to be about what happens before we see the project. I'll, I'll turn to Jim first. Jim, when, you, when you're thinking about putting together a deal, you know, just give us an idea of the kind of the time frame. How long does it typically take? for you to, to, uh, to put a deal together before you're involving the design professionals. Uh, I mean, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's good to see you. I've, I've worked with a few of you in the room, and it's, um, it feels comfortable. And uh, it's, there's a lot of great storytelling here. So I want to start with a story on how we kind of morphed the career and uh, how I did things before and how I do things now. Uh, you know, when you know, everybody likes to get to the blue sky right away. Uh, my first few, I used to bring the finance team in. Well, I know that a lot of you in here, uh, that's the Debbie Downer of the world, right? So I, I do that less often now, at least not in the beginning. 
but I think the purpose of, of kind of our panel is to kind of get you behind the scenes and, and see what happens before we get this constituent base involved. And the, the length of the deal is um, important for people to understand because, um, you know, there's very few things that happen now that happen quickly, especially in the, in the, in the land and entitlement business. So I would say right now, you're probably from brown dirt, if, you, if that's what you're looking at, you know, you're anywhere between three and five years, uh, sometimes longer, a little bit shorter, before even a group like you gets involved. And I think today we're going to kind of talk with you about what happens um, in that interim period and the struggles the developer goes with and how that sets you up for failure or success. But I would say in the average three to five years is probably what we're seeing right now, Matt. So that's, uh, again, quite eye-opening for us to think about, to think that so much of the project has already been framed up in that, in that period of time. John, do you have a similar time frame in some of the projects that you're working on, yeah, typically? And it, each, one, each one's different, but you've got to realize it depends on how many parties are involved. Do you have to buy or lease land? Are there anchor tenants you've got to get? Are there lenders to deal with? What's your corporate approval process? Do I have uh, environmental entitlements? So, um, you know, I've taken a year, year and a half just for the entitlement process. So it, it's not unusual. Uh, you know, an acquaintance of mine uh, developed the Albert's Resort in Lauderdale. It took him seven years. So it really depends on how many traps you've got to run and, and uh, you know, how they mess with you. So I'm imagining in that space. They never mess with you, do they? No, yeah. it's always smooth. So in that span of time, you're talking many, many years, I'm sure there's times where projects actually don't come to fruition. Uh, projects in the sense that we engage the design community and move forward. So tell me about some scenarios where, where again, we're talking about that phase, what, you know, what happens before we're even there? What happens before the designers are even there on the scene? Uh, what, what are some of the reasons that, that projects just fail to launch or, or, or deals fall apart? I mean, look, we're, we're all, most of us on the panel, we're involved in, in land acquisition, which is your primary, um, the way you start a project. So you've bought the land. A lot of times there's a, a significant period of due diligence that occurs before that. And what occurs in due diligence that would affect this group? Well, most of it, right? Because by the time it gets to you, you've, uh, unfortunately, a lot of times you've been kind of penned in and framed in, and you may not even know it. So I think it's important with, when you're with your developer client to kind of understand you know, what, what is the zoning, right? What, what, are, what is the municipality going to allow you to do and what, what won't they allow you to do? There's height restrictions, there's noise restrictions, um, off-site noise, on-site noise, so many things that, that will, will guide how, you, how this group reacts. Um, zoning and entitlement, um, uh, developers' agreements. You know, most municipalities now want to know what a developer is going to do before he does it because they want to have some, some, some guidance there. You know, straight zoning uh, is kind of a thing of the past. Now everything's kind of plan unit development or some type of plan development with a developer's agreement. So the developer, before you get involved, is committing to saving trees or building off-site roads or height restrictions or, you know, there's a million things that, that occur. And I think it's, it's prudent for this group to, to uh, I think the message you're going to hear from me is, you know, get more involved uh, with the developer and kind of what happened before you got there, because I think that's going to guide uh, your actions going forward. But there's so many uh, things, you know, for example, the, the trees, you know, can, uh, how many can you take down? How many do you have to move? How many do you have to replace? Every time you say something, the first thing the developer's thinking is, how much is that going to cost me? That's why we don't let the finance guy show up for the first few meetings, because he's going to hear stuff he doesn't want to hear. But I think you've got to understand that uh, so that you'll have a successful project. And uh, John, I'd ask you the, the, the same sort of question. You know, when, in your experience, what, what are some of the, 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 the ways that projects or deals start to <laughs> fall apart uh, before, before again, before the design team's even on the scene? I'd say more fail than succeed. Um, so, you know, when you get a, uh, like a lot of this room's clients, the Disney's, Tavistock's, Universal's, you know, they don't normally fail economically. They fail at an idea level and they, they get into a spin cycle of are we going to do it or what are we going to do, what the product is. But for a, for a private developer, the world really is a lot like what, what Jim says, and that's really the purpose of due diligence period. Um, and it, um, you know, it's, that's the whole reason. And the goal of an of a owner during that period is to evaluate his project at reasonable cost. Hey, I'd like to spend a half million dollars on my due diligence. Holy shit, the finance guys tell me, can I say that? 
uh, the, the, uh, cut. The, um, you know, the finance guys say, sorry, you know, it's a two and a half million dollar get in. So, um, the reason I see, you know, a lot of the private deals fail is A, they're too expensive. You get a cost and it doesn't pencils. Or your performa assumptions don't pan out. I can't get the theme park attendance. I can't get the rate at the hotel. I don't get the occupancy. Um, a lot of it is, I've had two projects fail in this regard, is that the owner underestimated his due diligence expenses and he just folded. You know, he did it. The entitlements are going too long. The city's retrading me. They want more drawings than I thought it was going to do. My soft costs are increasing. I'm out. So that due diligence period is just so important to congeal this job. Um, you know, and I, and I, like I said, in the private world, I'd say more fail than make it. Well, I'm imagining in that, in that due diligence phase, there's a balancing act for you, for you guys to play because obviously, the more due diligence you do, the more control you have over the outcome, but there's a cost to that. So how much cost and right. risk do you take on? I, I just have a general question. I, and I just, if you could, just a quick show of hands. How many folks that, that are on the design professional side have actually seen the developer's pro forma as they're moving through the process? Has anyone? <laughs> a couple hands. Uh, I mean, that, that, I think that kind of shows you the, the gist of our presentation here. Um, you're going to be judged, and the group's going to be judged on the success of the project, and it's your firm's reputation, et cetera. But no one knows the baseline pro forma that goes into the job. So let me give you a few examples, and I think you know, on the private side especially, um, this is where the projects struggle. So a lot of developers have a, there's a couple formats that a bank or a developer will use. Uh, it's either an IRR-driven formula, internal rate of return, or a multiple of invested capital, multiple of equity. So developers have kind of two views, and some use a combined view. But I think it's very prudent for you guys to know, is your developer a multiple-driven developer, which means he has a longer timeline, he just wants to make more total aggregate absolute dollars at the end of the day, or is he driven by IRR, which is velocity of money? You know, a lot of public companies run on the velocity of money scenario. I think understanding those dynamics, though, is so integral. Um, every project starts pretty much with a uh, financial pro forma. So if you haven't seen the pro forma, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tougher discussion with the developer as you're trying to get the work and engage, but it's an important discussion because you, you, got, you got to have to kind of understand the assumptions. So every pro forma, you know, there's a cash flow model, there's an assumption tab. The assumption tab would be very important for this room. And what the assumption tab basically says is, it, it's just not how much you have to spend, but it's other items like um, how much is it for the design professionals, you know, how much for horizontal land development, how much for vertical development, how much for, you know, city off-site infrastructure, how much for theming, how much for uh, interior design. All these things were put together in a performa to create an assumption that makes a financially viable project. Believe me, the developer's thinking about that every time he sits down with a group uh, and, and he's assessing, am I going to be over or under? And I think, you know, I, look, I, I've morphed, and I think most of us, including maybe John, is, is you know, we didn't, we didn't bring in the design professionals early enough. So now you're, you're tagged with a project that you've got to try to make work, but you don't understand the financial parameters that built the project. I think that's a dangerous spot to be. I, I think my, my new tact is to, disclose more than less so that this group understands kind of, you know, how do we have to march together? And then if there's risk and we're over in a certain area, how do we correct and bring it back in line with another bucket? You know, you can move dollars within these buckets, but sooner or later when all the buckets are overflowing, you know, there's going to be stress. So I think uh, understanding the pro forma, if the developer will share it, is, is, is very advantageous for the group. That's terrific, Jim. And I'm, I'm curious, John, if you share the same philosophy. I, I hear the kind of the, the strategy of transparency. The more, the more as an owner shares their business objectives and the details of their pro forma, the, 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 you know, the greater chance there's true collaboration with the design professionals. I, mean, I, I agree. I mean, when it comes down to it, if you think of real estate development, it's one big equation, literally. It's one equation. And it, the variables starts from what do you pay for the land? What do your entitlements cost? How much the cost of construction? What does it cost of your light fixtures? What are your professional fees? And then it goes into what are you going to get for the room? What's your throughput of the, of the theme park ticket? All that stuff. And it's one big equation. And when you say you build those assumptions, 
you come in and if you've got this and you change the land, your IRR changes, or you come in here and your professionals need additional services. So it is, it's, it's one big performa, and it, I mean, it, it's a black art and it can drive you crazy, but really it's just one giant equation and the developer's juggling a lot of it. So, I mean, the thing you guys need to know is a developer's not gonna, I mean, honestly, if somebody asked me for my Excel performa, no. I might give them PDF, but that's like, you know, how many hundreds of hours did you go into right. creating that, that beautiful piece of art? But you need to know your part in it. So an owner should disclose to you that, hey, you know what, I'm stressed. You know, you're, you're, you're causing me a point by your additional services or you need to help us, you know, get a couple percent out of the construction cost because this is my impact on my return. So they need to share the levers that they're pulling and how you play a part in what levers they pull. And that's not an unreasonable question, I don't think, for you guys to ask of the owners. I want to see what Disney says when you guys say, hey, can I see your performer for that new attraction? <laughs> I want to uh, ask a related question to pro forma, which is program, and the development of the program for the project, everything from if it's a hotel, the room count, or the, if it's a theme park, the size of the uh, park and the number of attractions. H how do you, Jim, first view, first view, how do you develop a program? Do you start engaging with the design professionals with that design of the program itself? Is the program something that you, as an owner, want to take on yourself? What's, what's your philosophy about I, I the program? Think, I think the, 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 the black art is, is some, some of these black holes in the pro forma <laughs> is the, is the, uh, program. the programming uh, because, you know, it goes from a dollar to, you know, a zillion dollars. Um, I think developers feel pretty comfortable with what the land cost is, what the entitlement risk is. That's their core business. Um, what they're not comfortable with, which they come to this group for, is what does this type of stuff cost? Um, everybody wants the cool latest thing, and I've been listening to some of the other presentations here. Everybody that engages this room to develop the next thing. Well, how many times do you head down the next thing path and you have any idea what this costs? Um, I remember when everybody was keen on wearables, right? And we started researching wearables. We couldn't even get in the parameters of this room what this thing was going to cost. So, you know, it took, a, you know, the great companies like Disney, et cetera, to kind of to put that together and make it more visible. But as a private developer, you don't have that benefit of, you know, spending millions of dollars just to figure out what the end cost is. You got to know kind of up front. So I think the programming is certainly one of the devilish pieces that, that go into um, pro forma modeling. But I think it's important to know what does that bucket represent for you uh, so you know kind of what happens. I think many of us know that you know, as programming and the things that come at the back end, uh, as there's development blows or budget blows, that's where value engineering occurs. I, you know, everybody hates that knit word, but the value engineering is another word for reducing, and, and that's where the dollars come flying out, which is pretty much the most important piece, unfortunately, but it's just at the back end, and, and that's where the stress is. And John, what, what's, what about you for programming? Is that something you take on yourself or are you engage? Yeah, so, so give you a little bit of how, how I work the process of programming. So in a you know, non-theme park environment, a, a major resort, uh, you know, program's key. It's a must. It's the Bible. It's what guides the project. It's the beginning anchor that you measure it. So <clears throat> we usually, if we're developing a product that we're familiar with, can generate an internal, what I call an owner's program. It's a high-level program, number of keys, you know, pools, ballrooms, there's a number of categories. And if you have experience in it, you can put a ROM on it and you can come up with an order of magnitude performa that, that we usually do internally that says, this is feasible, let's go out and, and, and test it. That's when we first get involved, you know, design teams, architects, land planners. And then so the first thing that we'll get from them is I consider that a test fit. That's the first time you see a graphical representation of your program and you see it. And that's when we start to interact. And you might look at it and go, oh, we need, okay, we need to test some more. We need an aquatics guy. So you need to get the right amount of professionals involved to fully vet that program. And then what happens is from that point through schematic design, the program evolves. The art, and, and I'll say another thing is that, it, you know, especially like in a, in a big resort, um, Architects have done a lot of times more hotels than we have, so to me, program is a, is a collaboration. Ours is a first draft, it's a point of view, but we want the market, the, the experts, to bring their best, best practices to help us make that program the best it can be. So as you're going through the test fits, the graphics, the pricing, 
The program's going to evolve. I do, though, believe that you know it's got to lock in its schematic design. For us, schematic design is, is a really robust gate because the program's got to lock, building envelope, cost. So schematic design is really robust. So we'll make sure we get enough design professionals on board to vet the program and design. But to me, and as you're designing it, and some of the architects in here that work for me know that when you give me a set of drawings, I need to know what that program is, an as-design program. So that first program is the draft, but you measure, you've got to measure yourself all the way, make changes, because you know, you've heard the word program creep. I thought this hotel was 400,000 square feet. How in the hell did we get to 500,000 feet? Uh, nobody was paying attention. So you know, program creep costs money, and it's the anchor you know, for us that we measure the project throughout. That's terrific. So we're, we're still in this period where we're still uh, thinking about what happens behind the scenes before the, generally before the, the designers are on board. I'm imagining now you're at a point where you're ready to go to the bank. T talk to me about what, what the bank wants to see for your, well, for your project. It usually involves cold sweats, hot flashes, <laughs> uh, you know, bourbon, the, yeah, well, alcohol. The, 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 the lending environment, as you know, uh, moves a lot. Um, I would say, you know, kind of where we're at today, uh, lenders are more cautious. Um, a lot of lenders feel it's getting later in the game. Uh, you know, baseball, it's, it's, you know, they've already sung in the seventh inning a lot of times. And, and I think, um, you know, as we're coming out of a cycle, um, you know, the lenders are cautious also. Then you've got that middle piece where they're fine and then, and then they get less fine. But I think the lenders, that's why this pro forma thing is so important. The lenders only want to see the pro forma. I mean, a lender is not lending because they're involved in the program, right? They're lending because the spreadsheet makes sense. You've had an adequate explanation, and they feel you're going to repay their loan. Um, it's your job to, you know, bring in um, all the graphics and, and kind of the story that you pitch the lender. But at the end of the day, they're primarily spreadsheet folks who have got to go through a series of approvals internally, and that spreadsheet's got to test some sensitivities. You know, what? another important part of the pro forma we didn't discuss is sensitivity. What happens when you turn left and you keep going left for a little while? You know, everybody wants to turn right and things are great, but the left side sensitivity is what a bank will do. And, and I would say today, you know, the lending environment is more conservatism, um, uh, um, lower loan to value. Uh, they want more equity in the game. Uh, they want less risk. There's still money out there to do these projects, but I think, uh, at least in the states here, uh, the lending environment is is more difficult than it used to be, uh, but they're gonna they're gonna hammer that poor froma and sensitize it until until we're all blue. And do they do they want to see the, the the glossy visuals too? Or they do they do. You've got to have the story. It's great about Sate is this is a storytelling group. So we'll engage uh, groups from this room to do the narrative. Right. We have to have a great narrative, a great story. Or you know, if you're going to the lender to help you with your narrative, you got real trouble. Uh, that's just not their background, you know, finance driven. So I, I love finance folks. Don't get me wrong. There's probably finance folks here, but, but that, that's not who you're going to do. You, you need a great storyteller to kind of spin the story. The model makes sense. The lender executes and, and everything keeps moving. Uh, but the lenders are, it's, it's much more difficult. One of the pieces I think we miss talking about is, um, and, and John can expand is, is on the consultancy that a lender will require you to have. And I, you know, there's, a half dozen major uh, consultants in the room that do feasibility studies for developers that do theme parks and resorts and things like that. That discussion of the inputs of that consultant's work are of <coughs> primary importance because that's what the, A, the developers built the pro forma on, but B, the bank is really looking for, even though I look like a trustworthy person and a very nice person, the bank's saying, Jim, that's great. Give me a third party piece of paper that justifies a single thing you're saying. So that's where, you know, we go to these, uh, uh, professionals to get the ba backup paperwork, to test the assumptions, to give us some foundation to, to build on. It goes, it goes back to the point that real estate development is one big, one big equation. And the banks are going to zero in on 20 of those variables and vet you and make sure that those are, those are solid. You know, some of them they don't care about. It's not going to hit the returns. But there's a certain amount of, you know, why did you build 400 rooms? Why not 300? Why not 500? How did you get to that number? 
high justify it. So the so the the aesthetic design they need to demonstrate how you're going to do what you're telling me you're going to do. So that's like a physical representation of okay, I got it. It fits. You can do that. And then the other one is you know validation of any assumptions and. That's where the string goes out. You think you're done, and they go, you know what, I need another market study. Or I don't believe that number, and so six weeks and $100,000 later, you're answering one question from some junior analyst who's trying to make a name for himself. So <laughs> that's an explanation of you know, what, what, uh, you know, what the environment's like. I'm imagining, again, in this phase, you're building a lot of uh, your performance, a lot of your risk around data. Like, how, how do you vet the data that you're getting uh, your full design team isn't there. Are you reaching out to design professionals? <clears throat> uh, how much do you reach out? How do you how do you vet the data that you're yeah, building so, this whole model model on? So, a couple things. You know, you've got to, like Jim said, you've got to have the right professionals on board to answer the questions. And even if you think you're the smartest owner in the world, if you've got to go through a lender, that doesn't that doesn't hold up. So, you know, you got to get the right professionals. And you know, a lot of it is vetting. Is uh, you know, from an assumption standpoint. Uh, making sure they know what they're doing. You know, the HVSs and, and PKFs of the world are always going to be conservative. They don't want to miss the mark. And you've, you've got to look them in the eye, meet them person to person, understand what their motivations are, and just negotiate a reasonable set of assumptions. Because they have no skin in the game and they have no risk. But if they're overly conservative in their assumptions and your project doesn't get underwritten, you're the one that's got all the risk. You know, from a cost standpoint, I'll tell you that if an owner comes to you and asks you to help them with the pre-construction uh, assistance, uh, it's the one thing that makes me nervous right now. It made me nervous the last couple of hotels I did at Tavistock. It's making me nervous now in that when you guys are all busy, when all the vendors and everybody's busy and somebody says they're going to do that a subcontract level pre-construction on the come, how do you know they're putting the effort into it? They're so busy. Are they just answering the question because they got to get it off their plate? So all I will say is that owners are making really important decisions on the input that you guys give us and the contractors give us. So if an owner asks you to do it and you're too busy, just say you're too busy. But do not accept the task and do a half-assed job because you've got to do a quality job because a lot of major decisions are being made on, on that input. And uh, um, so, you know, you've just got to vet it. It's time. It's conversations. It's spending time with people. It's not email traffic. I got the report. I'm going to believe it. You've got to just, how'd you get there? What'd you do it? Is this based on something else you did recently? Is this a 2005 project you just pulled out of the archives? So, you know, it's like anything. It's research and it's, it's just time. It's an investment of time. I, I would also say, though, you know, on the lender side, look, there's also an obligation on a quarterly basis pretty much that they're going to come back and test those assumptions because they're advancing dollars, right? They don't just don't give it all to you. So as they're advancing dollars, they're always going back to the pro forma. They're always going back to the third party consultant that helped you develop the pro forma. Is their mission creep? Is their programming creep? What is happening in this project? Because a lender's always thinking about, am I going to get paid back? They're, you know, they don't share on the upside. So they're always going to look at what is our risk here with the developer? Are we hearing the real story? And, and I think that's really important for you to understand those assumptions that went into that third party paper because ultimately, you know, the lender's going to want to make sure everybody's following that. Variances are okay as long as they're explainable, but wide turns, lenders don't do well. Well, and even if an owner doesn't share his performer with you, he's got to share his assumptions with you. Right. You know, I've assumed I can build this for 300 bucks a foot. I've assumed my theming budget's $5 million. I've assumed this. So he doesn't have to open up the kimono for the whole performa to share the assumptions that everybody's trying to meet those targets. Yeah. I, you know, I used to do, um, you know, when we would get a group that's like this together, you know, it used to be a very free-flowing ideas and, you know, kind of, you know, everything's on the table. And, and early on, I think that was great and it was a lot of fun. Um, but I think I've changed. Um, you know, we've, we've all got more financial constraints probably than we had before and, and more people to answer to. So, you know, I approach it a little differently now where I'm going to tell the design professionals, guys, here's kind of what my pro forma says and here's what I'm thinking on a lot of these big items. You know, so when we're doing our creative portion of it, people have some framework. You know, it, it's not $30 billion, right? If, if your programming budget is $3 million, I, I don't know that there's a problem with just telling people that this is our general range, right? Because all this group is charged with coming up the latest, greatest, coolest ideas, but if you've only got X to spend, 
you know, let's be, let's be honest with each other. I've had occasions where I've done that, disclosed assumptions, and the consultant looked at me and said, <laughs> sorry, that, that is not a good number. So next thing you know, right. you've got another million dollars there and you're adjusting somewhere else. Right. So, yeah. But yep. you know, you've got to ask the question. Yeah. I want to turn to the, uh, to, the, to the area of brands. Obviously, in the themed entertainment business, brands are a big part of, big part of the business. So from an owner's perspective, to talk to us about brands. How do, how do, you, how do you manage the relationship? Who, who holds the relationship with, the, with a brand on a branded uh, project between the, between the owner, the IP, the yeah. design team? I, you know, I think it's a great question. Look, most folks in here do a lot of IP work. Um, the IPs have a different view oftentimes than a developer. You know, they're trying to protect their IP, which is what they're supposed to do. A developer's trying to get the delta on the IP. So the way I look at it is, is when you're talking with IPs, you know, you've got your base case of your, your, your model, but if you bring in this specific IP over this IP, will it create alpha? Will it create the delta that, that is exponential? For example, if you have to pay an IP a dollar, will they bring you three dollars? Right? That's kind of how we view it. Um, it needs to be involved with the story and all that good stuff, but is there, is there a delta there? So we do a lot of brand work, and I, I love doing brands because I think, um, you know, we're in the travel industry. A, a lot of uh, our travelers and our guests are very uh, focused on the experience and the theme, so uh, we do it. But I would tell you that that's another constituent base that sometimes can have conflict with the developer, Sometimes it doesn't fit in the pro forma. Sometimes you didn't think you were going to have to bring a brand in early on. Again, an important discussion with the owner and developer. Um, are you going to be bringing a brand on? A brand's got brand standards. A brand costs money. A brand's, got, you know, they need input. They need approval rights. There's time involved there. So all those things the developer needs to understand by working with a brand, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great scenario, but it's also a whole new set of issues that a developer's got to be aware of. And, and the design professionals have to be aware of, obviously. It sounds to me like it's almost like a kind of a triangle because you've got the, the owner hiring the design professional. That's a clear relationship. The owner typically has an agreement with the IP, right. but then the IP is providing input to the designer, right. and they're not necessarily paying the designer. That's so, correct. So, so again, I guess it's, it's, about, it's about relationship and about managing that relationship, and I guess to get back to your, one of your early points about transparency up front, about who's... Who's after what and what's the role going to be in this, in this project? And, you know, IPs have very different standards. Some have, um, you know, let the developer a little more freewheeling. Some, you know, have a, a, a very, uh, you know, uh, constant monitoring program. So you've got to know that up front and, you know, you, you guys know it really well. But a lot of times the developer, where you could help the developer is he may or she may not know uh, the, intricacies of, uh, the intricacies of this IP. How long is their approval process? Is it costly? Are you paying the developer for this IP development? Are they developing and giving it back to you? You know, all these issues the developer needs to understand, and I think when dealing with an IP, that, that's, that's not as clean as it should be. Yeah, well, on my early days of dealing with hospitality brands, as a developer, I always tried to tell them as little as possible. Why do they want to know my budgets? What do they need to know that for? Why do they want to know my performa? So I held them off and tried to give them, but they're trying to make sure that they demonstrate you're going to perform on their brand. Then I went to work with Hard Rock, I'm on the other sides, and we rewrote our brand standards. Now I'm rewriting the brand standards. Okay, I want to see your budget, I want to see your schedule, right. I want to see right. right. you know, i got to prove to me that you're investing properly to protect the brand. So uh, it's a really interesting involvement. To me, the the best invention ever is the soft brand, the autograph collection, the curio collection, because now I can develop an independent hotel based on my own brands. And as long as I meet these performance, you know, experience standards, there's not the aesthetic control where you will use this carpet and you will use this. So, um, you know, brands, I think, though, they're a risk mitigator for a, for a hospitality developer. Um, I've worked in independent and at brands. And you know what? If you think you've got a great location and you can pull it off with an independent, you know, it's a preferred method economically, but you don't have a distribution network and, and brands, as expensive as they are, do bring value to the project. So, you know, a lot of times I've been in companies where we see them as much as a risk mitigator. Mm -hmm. So that value added is a risk mitigator. And honestly, you go to the lender and you say, I'm going to open an independent hotel in Charlotte, North Carolina. And they say, well, we're not giving you money. Oh, I've got a Marriott autograph collection hotel and I've already got a brand agreement. You know, you just go up the chain on your on your underwriting standards. Yeah. That's correct. 
So now let's turn to, uh, you've, you've come to the point where you're about to, br you're bringing on the team. It's time to start building the professional team and, and uh, the, the project is moving Sheesh. forward. Um, we've talked a little bit about the kind of the spectrum of, of, uh, of, the, of the process from putting together the deal and the meetings with the banks and some of those involve the design professionals. But now you're at the point where you're really building the whole team. So, so, uh, so John, I'll start with you. When you're, when you're thinking of building a, a design team, is it, is it, is it the same old, same old team that you go to each time? Are you opening it up widely? How do you, how, what's your process? How do you go about <coughs> selecting, and not only the lead consultants, but how deep do you go in terms of bringing on the full, full design team? Well, I mean, I've got kind of two philosophies that guide me. One is, um, you know, you've got to create an environment for success. So to me, that has a couple of key components. You've got to get a team that knows what they're doing. I've had an architect tell me, and I want to do a hotel. I said, have you done any hotels? He says, no. I said, well, then I'm not doing any hotel. How do I do a hotel? You've got to find an owner that's going to let you do his first your first hotel. That's not me. So I hire a team that's got uh, experience in what they do. I've got the, the what I call a one plus one is three theory, and that is I want to hire consultants that are really good at what they do and know it because they bring value to the table. I like to run a best practices team so that they can bring things. They, they've seen more hotels around the world than I have. I want their learnings. I want them to add value. Um, and then so, so the other thing is, is, is it what I call phase alignment in that you can't bring people on too late. People will say, I'm going to bring the graphics guy on when I'm in CDs or whatever. You, you got to bring people on when you need them if you want a wholly integrated design. So how I pick them, I, we start objectively um, with a list of objectives. Uh, What's the product? What's the experience? Is it a coastal product? I need a guy that knows how to work in a salt environment. Um, and, and we create a list of six, 10, 12 people, narrow it down. And part of it is a stylistic fit. We assemble teams so they all get along. They need to play well together. You know, is EDSA going to talk to HKS, going to talk to these guys, going to talk to these guys? So, and, and the next level is people. What's your workload? Can you perform it? You know, are you overloaded? I want to meet the guy. And, and you're really, the owner is the orchestra leader and he's the camp counselor. So you've got to put people together that are going to play well and know what they're doing. Because I believe that you, you've got to build a high performing team because when things go wrong, you want a high performing team to figure out how to get through it. If there's drama and issues among the team or a guy, and, and the last thing I'll say is that, you know, each firm has its own motivation. If you get an architect that screwed up on his fee, his motivation for the rest of the job is going to be increase his utilization, spend as few hours as possible and get his fee back. You might have a fabricator that says, I'm going to get into this market, I'm going to kill it, I don't care if I spend a little money, I'll charge it to marketing and I'm going to you know, make this the best job ever. So the thing on the owner too is meet your people and understand their motiva motivation, uh, create fair contracts because you build that high performing team, then you can weather the storm when it hits the fan. And just two other comments. Um, I think, you know, we like to start with storytelling. Uh, that's why I love coming to these groups is uh, you guys are great storytellers. So the narrative has got to make sense for everybody, including owner, lender, et cetera. And then I think the second thing is strong project management as you're building your team, both internally for the developer and then the uh, main consultants is we're going to be very focused on who your project manager is. Um, that's really who's driving the ship here. Uh, there's a lot of great companies, but at the end of the day, the project manager in that company is really going to be success or failure. So I think we've put more emphasis on internal project management on our side uh, to make sure that the, the blend with the consultant team is, is, works well. That's terrific. I'm, in just a minute, I'm going to be opening up uh, for questions from the audience. So I hope you've been thinking about what do you want to ask uh, Jim and John about, uh, about this presentation. But I do have one more question for, for each, each of you gentlemen. Um, turning the tables around to, uh, to the consultants in the group in here, you know, what, what, what do you wish you knew more about? When you're thinking about this team, what do you wish you knew more about your consultants? We're talking about lifting up the curtain and, and right. kind of opening up the dialogue. What, what are the top things you wish you knew about when you were building that core team about your consultants? You know, it's, 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 as you're interviewing the consultants, you know, you're thinking about, are they going to spend all my money? And are they going to overspend all my money? Uh, I think is, is, is important. But I, look, the, the reason we developers come to this room is to create dynamic, fantastic projects that exceed pro forma. Um, I would like 
to know from the principal's perspective of the firm we approach is how do they feel about this project? I think John made it very, very, very articulate. Do you have the time to spend? Do you have the right project manager? Am I gonna be able to meet that project manager? You know, frankly, uh, you know, the name owner typically does the first intake, but we all know as the developer, that's not typically who's gonna work on your project. So I'm much more focused on, all right, take me down the next few lines here, because as soon as you sign me up and, and move me along, I'm dealing with that group. That group's gonna make or break my project. So I would, I'm, I'm very focused on, um, when I approach the consultant, who is gonna be working on my job? Is that a good personality fit? Obviously, are they capable? And then I, I always like the principal to at least have some involvement on a weekly, monthly basis, because that's why I came to your firm is because, you know, the, the, the ideation was from the founder, et cetera. So I like to have that relationship where I can get it. Yeah, I mean, I, I ask a lot of questions up front, do my due diligence on the firms, but the thing, the thing I want to know more of is, you know, what have you seen? I love being in the design meetings and letting the architect or the land planner tell a story. You know, we did this thing in, uh, in the Bahamas, this pool came over and it was really good. And so I want to know what you've done. Again, we only know what we know. So we hire people that have experience in it so we can get the benefits of that. You know, I always tell people, if you want an owner that's going to be adventurous, that's me. So that stuff you've had in your pocket, just like, God, I wish sometimes I had an owner we could try that out. I'd really like to walk under the lagoon around there and over the bend. It was like, okay, bring those ideas to me. So what I really want to know is what you guys have seen and, you know, what that exciting stuff is because you, I'm sure there's like all kinds of unrealized ideas in your heads. And uh, those are the types of things that I want to know is, you know, what's out there and how can we, we within reasonable cost, you know, make this some, uh, you know, some really uh, killer place. Thank you. So this is, uh, we're going to turn now to the uh, Q&A period. This has I been quite uh, confidential and we'd love to get some, some uh, questions from the group here to pose to, to uh, the two gentlemen you have in front of us. That flew by. Yeah, it did. Mm -hmm. Uh, no question. There's a question right here. I know this rarely happens, but when a project does go over budget, talk a little bit about your value engineering process and how you work through that. Let me take that one. Well, typically you don't want to be the guys after that, right? Because that's, that's where the value engineering usually occurs. But I think it's a great question, and I think that gets back to, you know, what is your baseline pro forma? There's still buckets left. There's buckets of money for things. So when you're over budget, you know, obviously the lender's going to have some tolerance of, yes, we can make a future advance. That would be good for you to know. If the lender's saying, guys, there's no more money, that would be a good thing to know. So I think the sources and uses of funds for this group when there's, when you're over budget is important. And where are those funds coming from? Um, you know, the developer's got, right, the big eyes and the, the deer's right in the headlights. So he's trying to figure it out also. But your participation in, hey, here's where I think we could bring the value engineering ideas. That is such a tremendous benefit for this group. And, and, and you know, that's what you guys do well. So um, there is an issue. Uh, we want to keep this thing on the rails, but adjustments need to be made. And, and that's where this group is all important. Well, one more question you can ask your client is, what's his contingency strategy? Because I talk about creating the environment for success. You know, Part of it, what is it, owners got to have a really well thought out contingency strategy. In the hospitality world, you know, I want to start construction with 2% contingency for unforeseen conditions. A contractor is going to tell you he's got a 5% margin on his pricing. So you better have seven going in when you bid a job just to cover yourself. So it, it and just ask your owner, he doesn't, might have to disclose, but does he have a strategy? Because value engineering, as long as it doesn't affect the guest experience, there's a lot of things you can do. But ultimately, if he has a poor contingency strategy and he's really over budget, it's coming out of his pocket. Right. There is, I mean, that bucket is finite. It is. Uh, John, I've, I've heard you say, as an owner, you have to have the courage to look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, <laughs> am I an owner? So I used to- a Am I gonna be able to own this project? And you're, I guess you're yeah. saying to the consultants, they should be asking the same kind of Tough questions in a way. Yeah, I mean, I tell owners, I used to sell services, I say, look, guys, if you're doing a job, owner has a lot of responsibility, a lot of things to do. So look in the mirror. If you're qualified to be an owner, go for it. If not, get professional help. <laughs> uh, hi there. Um, I had a question that relates to the previous presentation as well. 
Are you guys finding that, that assumes we saw it, right? <laughs> <laughs> are you finding that AR and VR are useful tools mm. for communication with uh, for yourselves, with the creative team, or with the lending team? Yeah, lenders love it. You know, they question. think it's cool, new, and sexy. I think that probably, you know, helps you sell your narrative that you're bringing on this, you know, cool AR VR. Um, I think the scary thing with AR VR is, you know, if you're not one of the big guys. Um, you don't really know what this stuff costs. And, and I think that's where the trepidation occurs is, you know, can you accurately portray to an owner, look, if you want to go down the AR, VR path, here's kind of what's in your budget and, and what you can model. And, and, you know, you don't want to be, you know, putting a program together into a black hole because I think that's a bad result for everybody. But I'm telling you, is, is, especially in the hospitality industry, that's all anybody, all the, all the guests wants an experiential travel and AR VR is absolutely the top of their mind. From a design standpoint, I won't do a project without it. Um, we just did a hotel and you know, without, without 3D, and there's, there's a lot of different ways. There's, there's, you know, fixed points where you can rotate and they kind of distort the aspect ratios go away. And then there's some new firms that, uh, have it built on gaming engines. So you can really move around and it's, it's, uh, spatially real. Um, but we modeled this thing extensively before we spent a half million dollars on a model room. So $40,000 worth of 3D to build a model room right once was invaluable. The other thing is, you know, if you've got corporate ownership that isn't good at visualizing plans, you know, it, it, it is worth every penny. So it saves you physical models. You know, we've studied a lot of different ways to do it. I'm kind of a fan of the gaming engine because you can just, you can continually build on it uh, and, and fly through. It's, it takes, we had to buy an alien where to be able to run the damn thing. But um, I think from a design standpoint, we met an architect that now, 3D models it, gets approval, then draws it. And if you think about it, why would you spend all the time spending doing a schematic or a design level, spend a million dollars on plans, and then have a guy say, okay, here's my drawings, make a model. Make the model for 50 grand, and then draw it. So I think, the, I think 3D is gonna change the way, I don't know, the architects in the room, I've talked to the ones, they're hiring gamers out of college as much as they are architectural graduates. So. I think it's going to change the process of conceptual design. Right. Agreed. I see one at the very back and one right over here. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering, with uh, unpredictable tariffs starting across the global uh, trade landscape, uh, do you see that affecting sort of the, uh, the speed at which this industry is expanding due to possible uh, not being able to get loans to build these giant developments? Well, I can tell you that we're looking at our spending. We'll probably write contracts before the end of the year just to take some off. So it's already affected. You know, I'm at a schematic level on one project, and it's already affected us. It's it's uh, it's real. I mean, the contractors are pricing it in. So it, it, it is there. real. But but from a developer's perspective, the, most developers now know they've got to have an experiential piece. So I think this room is in very good stead because regardless of the lending environment there's a spend that needs to occur there that probably didn't need to occur 20 years ago, but every developer knows that that's got to happen, so yeah, I, I think this room's in good shape. Yeah, I don't see it killing, I don't see it killing project. It's, again, it's going to change those variables in the right. equation and, you know, make a developer react to it, but right. I don't... It, yeah. It's a good question. It's a, as a part of the global, our GDP, it's actually a really small number. Right. I think there was someone at the very back. Oh, okay, over here. Yeah, check. Hi, um, I'm a design firm, and I wanted to know, where do you go for finding resources? You know, it's uh, a couple things. Um, as we're building our pro forma and hiring those feasibility consultants, you know, those feasibility consultants have, have, are in the industry, and they're reaching out to folks like you saying, hey, what is your proficiency here? What does this cost? What, what do you think about this idea? What do you think about that idea? I think that's probably our most productive initial line, you know, just other than pre-existing relationships. But I think the feasibility consultants provide a lot of that initial, architects also, but a lot of the initial um, contact comes from them. Google. <laughs> <laughs> to follow on that. I mean, it I takes research. It, it, for me to put together an architect list might take me a month. Yeah. I'm gonna look at who's won awards, who am I looking at, what's a stylistic fit, you know. Uh, I did an objective study and Seven out of nine of them were from New York. I'm like, I need somebody in 
like Miami, somewhere closer. <laughs> I have a two-part question to kind of follow that up. First of all, when you're looking at a lead consultant, are you primarily driven towards design build firms or are you open to design and build? That's part A. Part B, when you have a lead consultant, do you have them serve as the contract manager for the subconsultants, i.e. be the bank? Or do you manage all those individual contracts yourself? Um, it depends. I, um, on a large project, and it also depends on what kind of owner you're working for. I've worked for owners where I had a six-man staff, and given, given my druthers, I'd like to have an architect, I like the land planner direct to me, uh, civil engineer direct to me, and, and I like to, to, to have a staff and do that directly. Sometimes I'm with an owner there where they don't give us staff. You have to leverage yourself through the architect. So it really depends on, on the situation. Um, and on a design build in the hospitality world, it, it depends on the product type. On a, on a bespoke full service hotel, I would not go design build because as an owner I'm too involved in the design and, and I'm not going to delegate that authority. If I'm putting up a Hampton Inn or I'm doing something where the standards are well defined and, and all that, then you know design build is a risk mitigator for me. It, it might make complete sense. So I think it's, I'm, I'm flexible on it. Another thing I'll do in between concept and schematic, and output of schematic design is procurement strategy. So you know you got to match your procurement strategy and your um, prime organization, you know, to the situation. I think, I think um, you're going to, there's probably a couple of different ways to cut developers, but one of them is, you know, their, their basic philosophy of bundling or unbundling. So when you approach a developer, and he's, he's approaching you about a project, you're going to find out very clearly whether he likes parts and pieces or he feels comfortable with the design build strategy, you know, kind of an all in one. Um, a lot of times the lenders um, like a design build because it, it gives them more certainty. So I think that's one of the parameters. But I think it's obviously developer driven, but I think most of the time uh, what I've seen is is they prefer the unbundling, especially in the very early stages, because you really don't have a good handle on what's happening yet. It depends on the architectural firm too, because if you bundle it, they've got to be able to manage it. They need, to your point earlier, Project management, you know, it's a different mindset, it's a different skill set, it's a different type of person. Some architecture firms have great PM, some don't. So, um, you know, it, it depends on the type of firm. I, I tend to lend towards design build on components, you know, feature right. pools, islands, thing, you know, things that lend themselves to, to uh, delivery of a really unique uh, piece of a component of a project, less so at a, at a high level prime. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Ah. Hi, um, you had mentioned earlier about um, bringing designers in earlier to the development stage of the project or you know, picking the right people to make your development and project teams. Um, do you think there's, do you think the culture can change in the industry where we can invest in having more designers be involved in that development process so they do see the performas and the assumptions, you know, to make better designers, but also have project teams where it can be more diverse, you know, to create more ideation so that people there, you know, it's just made up of different people from different backgrounds and different, um, different industries. Do you think there's benefit in that sort of investment to creating better teams? Investment by who? The, by you or by the owner? Well, I guess just in, in general, just like the culture of the, the industry, um, both so that way, you know, when the project does line up, everything, you know, there's, there's more ideation, there's more right. I, for me, designers. For me, firms that have that ability to move upstream and help me at the front end have an advantage. Um, I think if you can't do that, you know, you're not in the broader spectrum of, op of solutions for the owner. So, you know, for us, I mean, you need somebody that can move upstream, whether we choose to pick them and how far you tend to contract that's, you know, a, a project by project basis. But I think from your perspective, if uh, the firms, you know, contractors and the firms that I like to work with the best and on a repeat basis is those that have very robust pre-construction capabilities. Because again, the risk profile for a project is established at the beginning. By the time you've hit schematic design, you're cooked. You know, your assumptions are good or they're not. Your team is good or it's not. And the risk profiles is set at the beginning. So part of having that firm that can help you at the front end 
is a, is a risk mitigator to make sure that all those assumptions are more reliable. I, I think that's a great point. I think the premise of this panel was to educate the group on this pre-construction phase, which is the developer's highest anxiety, the bank probably not involved yet. You know, the, the assistance you can lend toward firming up those pro forma assumptions is just it's invaluable. In, oh, it's invaluable. I mean, it's just invaluable. And I tell you, the bond you create with the developer once there, there's confidence there, I mean, it's, it's immeasurable. I mean, it's just, you, you couldn't break that bond, at that, in my opinion. That's why when firms say, I don't market, I have all repeat clients, it's because they've done it, they've performed it, and the developer's been successful because that person helped them mitigate that risk and create that set of assumptions at the front end. Right. Thank you, guys, and that's a great, uh, I think, a great note to end on. Thank you to everybody here, and... Uh, Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you.